let's put story aside. Everybody sure. freaks out and says, oh my God, it's all about the script. Yeah, the story is important, but let's talk about the look and production value of the film. For me, there's there's five elements in, in no specific order. Uh, your cinematographer has got to know his craft. You you have to get actors that are, that I, I hate to keep using the term, know their craft. And Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. I'd like to welcome back to the show, returning champion, Shane Stanley. How are you doing, Shane? I am doing great, Alex. Thanks for having me, man. It's great to see you. Thanks for coming back on the show, brother. I, uh, I... I, I appreciate you coming back and you and I have been working together for a little while. We've got a couple of courses up on IFH Academy. We got your book uh, about what they don't teach you at film school up on IFH books. Uh, and, and maybe in the next few weeks, we're going to be releasing a few chapters of that book for free. So everyone can kind of get a taste of your genius and uh-huh. what's inside and what's inside that book uh, that will hopefully save a lot of filmmakers lives. But today we're here. This one right here. That one right there. What what, what you what don't, you learn, don't learn exactly. So, um, but so today we're here to talk about uh, your new film, Double Threat. But I just want to get in the weeds a little bit about filmmaking and about where uh, where how you put this thing together, the realities of what's going on from financing to distribution and so on. So, but first, man, can you tell a little bit about yourself to people who did not listen to your first interview with me? Well, absolutely. You know, I grew up in the industry. Um, I actually uh, became a working actor at nine months old. My father was a working actor. We were at a barbecue and there was a guy kind of looking at me from across the backyard. My dad's very protective. So he just walked right up to the guy and goes, I don't like the way you're looking at my kid. What's your jam? And uh, he said, oh, no, no, I'm a commercial director. I'm doing a new campaign for Century 21. It's this new real estate company and I need a baby. And your kid's been sitting there quiet and perked up and well behaved. And we can't find a kid that doesn't scream. So long story short, I became this working kid baby actor till I was, you know, in fourth, fifth, sixth grade. But during that time, my father got out of acting and, and became a working documentary and educational filmmaker. So he had the flatbeds, the, the movieolas, the splicers and 16 millimeter cameras. And so from a very young age, I started playing around on those cameras and, and the splicers and, and movieolas. And he just started working and working and working and he was doing everything at such a low budget. He was literally pulling on me to, to work in the camera department, the editing department. So I grew up in and around the business that way. And as I got older, um, around the time I was in high school, he finally got his big break. And it was on a film that, that, you know, he did with Michael Landon that I was very, very much a part of. And um, that changed our lives. And we started making this, you know, a television series of movie of the weeks uh, for about nine years, which spawned into Gridiron Gang, which was a remake of one of our MOW documentaries. And I, I started going down the path of working in a television network and studio system. Um, and I just, I, I didn't like development. I didn't like meetings. I didn't like talking about movies getting made. I wanted to make movies. And when I, uh, probably about 12, 13 years ago, after my 1500 meeting at one of the networks, the, the head of the network called me into his office and said, uh, let's talk. And we put our feet up on his coffee table. He poured us a glass of scotch and he said, it's obvious you're unhappy with this process. You're a filmmaker. Get out of here. Go make movies. And so I, I got $500 together and made a pilot for, you know, a 45 minute pilot, which did more for my career as a filmmaker than any of my resume previously. And um, I've been on that path ever since. And it's been, it's been quite a ride. It's been, it has been served without question. You have made a bunch of independent films over the years. And I know that, you know, 
a couple of things that you should avoid in regards to making an independent film. Like what are a few things that make your independent film look cheap, look low budget? Because you make high quality, high looking budget films at low budget. But I, I've seen them too, man. I even worked on a few of them when I was coming up uh, as a colorist and an editor where you look at the stuff, you're like, dude, why did you just, Oh God, why did you shoot against the white wall? Why did, why, you did you get, why did you get your aunt to, to play a big role in your movie? Uh, yeah. <laughs> to me, you know, look, let's put story aside. Everybody sure. freaks out and says, Oh my God, it's all about the script. Yeah. The story is important, but let's talk about the look and production value of the film. For me, there's, there's five elements in, in no specific order. Uh, your cinematographer has got to know his craft. You, you have to get actors that, are that I, I hate to keep using the term know their craft and, and a lot of new filmmakers say well I don't know any working actors that's okay go to local uh acting classes call colleges there are a lot of actors amongst us that we don't think about but most of the time they're calling their friends their girlfriends their aunt their mom their dad their neighbor to star in their movies and it just sinks the ship and and there's no reason you can't be working with talent um i think that um the, another thing is so important is location so many people just shoot in their backyard their garage their house um People want to experience new things. And for me, everything is about location and making something look big. Uh, another element is the editing. Uh, I think that's absolutely key. Uh, an editor can, can sink or swim a film in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And the other one is sound, production sound. Um, <laughs> I've been fortunate on my last nine films to work with a guy. I haven't had to ADR one line with the exception of we did a scene in a car and we had to, we knew we weren't going to get it because of where we were driving and the organic nature I wanted this shot in. And we shot it with the camera trays and the sound man said, just go get this as scratch. We'll, we'll get them in the trailer doing it later. And that's, I, you have to have a great sound man, a good editor, a good cinematographer, good actors, and good locations. I think if you have those five things, you have already stepped your game so far up that you're going to, you're going to separate yourself. You know, it's, it's I always say it's, it separates the sheep from the goats. Yeah. And I think the other, other thing I would add to that is to just, when you frame things, just frame it with a little bit of scope, a little bit of, of uh, depth in a shot. So like so many times I see shots where, Oh God, look, they shot uh, two people talking against a white wall. There's nothing I, interesting I, in that at all. Shoot it no. out the window at least. Shoot it out the window. Go outside. You know, go go to a uh, you know a set of tracked houses on a day they're not doing the trash. You know, and um, you know, put a long lens on that thing and just get some depth and some open. You know, and just that's just it. Is most of the student films or indie films that I look at, and I know you and I have talked about this. They shoot it up against a white wall, or they shoot it in a garage or a bedroom, and these things could just be taken outside or put into some new area and our job as storytellers is to take an audience to either a place they've never been a place they are afraid to go a place that they want to go or something they didn't know exist and i think every time you set something up you need to, to think that way it's huge yeah no question and and i love because uh, in your new movie double threat there's a scene that you know you're talking about people want to be taken to a new place things you haven't seen before i haven't seen a woman on horseback with a bow and arrow chasing down a car um, ever uh, <laughs> that I can Good remember. Without a stunt double. <laughs> exactly. It didn't look like a stunt double. So we'll get into how you shot that in a little bit. But that was just like something you're just like, hey, something I don't see every day. That's that's interesting. So adding little elements like that of something you just like, I've never seen that before uh, adds a tremendous amount of value to your project. It's gotten a lot of mileage. And also, you know, Danielle C. Ryan is the actor you're referring to. Danielle had one mandate and, and she produced the film with me as no stunt doubles. I can do anything that you need me to do. And, you know, there's a three and a half minute fight scene in that film, not one double. She rehearsed it with Dr. Haim and the other guys for one day on her day off. They showed up, we knocked it out. And, you know, that was the thing, you know, we shot that film in the heart of the pandemic. We filmed it in November, December of 2020. And we lost nine locations. Going back to locations, we had nine locations committed to the film that one after another dropped out during production. And we had a friend with a film ranch who just said, dude, 
here are the keys, lock yourselves up on the hill and go do what you got to do. And so we were very limited. I had that, I had a warehouse, I had a, a hot dog stand and we had my cousin's cabin in Big Bear. Those were the only locations we had. And I would have loved to have shot that film all over the world, but we couldn't because of COVID. So taking what we were talking about a second ago is, yeah, is how do we make this interesting? Let's put a girl on horseback, shooting a bow and arrow, hitting a moving target, which she actually did. Um, let's get car chases. Let's have fun with this. Let's do a, a, let's go to the airport and steal a plane and have Matthew Lawrence start it up and take off. I mean, we had no stunt doubles in this film and that was kind of our hook. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now I, in, a, in, in another interview, I heard you talk about the 11 minute rule that filmmakers yeah. and screenwriters should follow. What is the 11 minute rule? I will, I will tell you something funny. I got a lot of heat for that. I was doing an interview and before we started, you know, I just said casually, I said, I think there's an 11 minute rule. And I learned this from sales agents that, you know, when you make as storytellers, the must were Spielberg or, you know, Christopher Nolan, what they're going to sit for two hours before you get to the point. I've learned when you're making an indie film, especially in the climate of streaming and, 300,000 channels at your fingertips, you better let your audience know what's going on within. I've heard from sales agents and distributors, they've been beating into my head for the last six or seven years. You've got 11 minutes to get to the point or they're, we're out. They're, they're gonna, you're going to lose them. And I mentioned this on another interview and I got crucified uh, for saying that. And of course it was Hi. all the people that have never made a movie before who've never sold a film. And I learned it by having movies that were building and developing characters with sales agents saying, you've got to take three or four minutes out of your movie. You've got to get to it by 10, 11 minutes, dude. If you don't, we're not going to get a sale. So, you know, everybody likes to develop backstory and character and, you know, all, all the, you know, all the aficionados out there that have their rules that they believe they need to follow. Um, and they crucified me, which is fine. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. But what was really funny is I am actually a work for hire as a director on a studio film right now that starts in August. I was mm -hmm. hired by a studio to, to direct a film. And what was so funny is we had our first meeting and they wanted me to read the script and they never saw the interview. They don't care about any of the stuff I do outside of what they need me for. And one of the executives actually said to me, there is an 11 minute rule that we need to follow. This script doesn't do it. It gets in at about 13 or 14 minutes where we finally know what the hell's going on. We need you to, as a director, to do a director polish and get us to this 11 minute point. And I said to him, I said, well, where did you hear about this rule? And they said, it's just a rule, follow it. <laughs> and I've never heard the term 11 minute rule until, and I'm not saying I coined the phrase like Richard, sure. you know, uh, like uh, that wonderful comedian that said he, he coined the lunch from hell or the something from hell. But I had never heard the term. I, it was brought up in the interview, but I, I have found, especially in the independent world, when you're hustling and you're trying to sell your stuff, if your audience doesn't know what the hell's going on and what the journey is going to be, of course, surprises down the road are good, but if they don't know what the whole setup is and who the players are by 10, 11 minutes, man, good luck. Good luck. No. And that's the thing. And, and this is the difference where a lot of filmmakers don't understand that in the eighties, nineties, even the early two thousands, people would go to a theater, they sit down or in the eighties and nineties, they would rent a movie they've paid for it. They're going to watch it. You they're got it. You're hooked. You're hooked. But in today's world, you're flipping, 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 flipping. And there is tens of millions of pieces of content for you to consume and movies and, ele and television and entertainment for you to watch that I'd argue it's like much faster than 11 minutes because it is for me. I, I, I'll sit there and I'll start watching something and man, like we were watching a show. What was it? I forgot the name of the show, but it was supposedly a really good show. Oh, no, it's like a new HBO show. I'm not going to name the show, but we were watching this new HBO show and it was like a drama and we're just sitting there going, I'm like, what? This is so slow. My wife and I just like eight minutes in, we're like, I can't. Great cast, same oh. cast, great yeah. writers. Great. Yeah. I just, it just took too long for me to get into it. I was just like, if this is the pace of the show, then I'm not going to be able to keep going with it. So I just started watching Mayor of Kingstown. How do you like it? I, I'm, I'm in the middle of it right now. I Some of the, I, I saw the whole, I saw, you're talking about Jeremy Renner's show. Yeah, yeah, Taylor, Taylor Sheridan. So Taylor Sheridan. Absolutely <laughs> loved it. It's got, you know, look, you can pick apart any series. Wouldn't we all love to be sure, that? Sure, sure. Taylor's got it going on right now. I'll tell you something, that the last two episodes, it's a two-part episode, 
I'm a, I'm a cutter at heart. I'm an editor at heart. This is the best cutting. There's a scene in the prison yard. I'm not going to ruin it for you. It's the best editing I've ever seen on television. And it's, it's comparable. I thought I always thought Braveheart's battle scenes were the best cut I had ever seen. Oh, those are gorgeous. It's comparable to the Braveheart stuff. I was just, I, I rewatched the episodes just for the cutting. It was, I, I love the show and I, I hope so, it comes back. So, the, so yeah, I think they're definitely bringing it back. Yeah. But Mayor of Kingston is, for everybody not listening, is a show by Taylor Sheridan, who is right now the most... Uh, the busiest human being in Hollywood has, I think, 11 shows in the pipeline. 1883, um, Yellowstone, he's got. 1932, uh, and then there's like four or five other ones that are just the one with uh, Sylvester Stallone's coming out. Like everybody yeah. in the in the country, in the world wants to work with him. So yeah. he's got like, I think literally, I'm not exaggerating, about 11 shows running. As What's really creator. cool. What's really cool, if I can interject, is Don Olivieri, who co-stars and co-stars in Double Threat, the film that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. She was in 1883, and they they loved her so much. She is going to be in Yellowstone uh, this year. She's, I mean, the whole season. I mean, how cool is that? I'm so proud of, of her. Well, Yellowstone. And I'm allowed greatest. to say that. I'm allowed to say that because they that news broke two days ago. So I'm like, oh, that's I'm awesome. I love. I mean, I'm so proud of her. But the reason why I bring that show up is because the first pilot, I'm sitting there watching the pilot of that, the first episode, I'm just going, it's just so tight. Yep. It's so in. I'm Oof. so I'm so in. And then there's the twist in this in the pilot, which we won't tell you about. And you're just like, what the hell? Done. You're hooked for the series because of what they did in the pilot. One of the best pilots I've seen in, in a while. In a while. And, and Taylor is so good at those pilots. I'll tell you, going back to what you said a second ago, that is so key. When we were making movies in, up until probably 10 years ago, um, you got them in the theater, they were hooked. They weren't going anywhere. They, they paid for the DVD or the VHS. They weren't going anywhere. Now, the problem is, is the distractions, the phone, so even if they're streaming your show, this is going off. They've got a tablet. They got a kid crying. There's it, it, so you have to make your show look like they can't blink, and that's that was the point of the whole eleven minute rule is. And I've learned it the hard way because when we did Break Even, look, love it or hate it, that film had more potholes in it than than a poorly paved road. But the problem was we took twenty minutes out which left those holes so we could make our deals. That was the problem. And that 11 minute rule, that was what everybody said is you, it takes you 21 minutes to get to the damn point. We don't know what the kids are doing until 17 minutes in. Once we hit that 11 minute point, everything changed. I thought the movie suffered greatly for it in, in plot and story. And that's unfortunate, but it made the deals when you talk about business. And, and that was where that was coming from. You know what? And, and 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 then we'll get off the Taylor train for a second because I just like just such a fan of Taylor's. Oh, yeah. he's so he's so must see TV for yes. my wife and I well that said. when the new season of Yellowstone is up, my kids know. Are you guys? See, it's Yellowstone night. Okay, we won't we won't knock on the door because if they knock on the door while Yellowstone's on, they know they're gonna get it. So like <laughs> anytime they walk in, but like so Yellowstone, and now we're like it's Mayor of Kingstown. No, 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 no. I no, don't want to hear anything for an hour. Go away, go away. Ah. Dad, the you, house is on fire. I don't hey, care. We, there's a fire extinguisher under the under the sink. Just deal with it. Um, <laughs> But that's Taylor. That's the kind of writing that that Taylor does. The kind of filmmaking right. he does with his shows, right. and that is he is he is a writer and a creator for this moment in time, and he's, probably the best. He's probably arguably one of the best Absolutely. writers in television right now. Arguably, also, I mean, Sicario. Jesus Christ, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. Jimmy, just Sicario. I mean, all his movies. Where I mean, uh, Hell of High Water. You just like, oh yeah. You know, and I was watching an interview about him the other day. Uh, I think it was on CBS or something like that. And they were, he's like, yeah, after 20 years of, you know, being number 11 on the call sheet, someone said you should write. And the first thing he wrote was the pilot of Mayor, Mayor of Kingstown. That's and then right. after he wrote it, he goes, damn it, I wish I would have been doing this 15 years ago. He was just never wrote before that. And he never, he just, and then he just kept going. And he and he said, which is the best. He's like, I do movies because to, to support my horse habit. Yep. <laughs> and, and that's, I think, why he and Don hit it off so well is because, you know, she, she lives on like this huge ranch. And, um, 
she is, she is all about the horses. And I remember when we were working together on Double Threat, she was like, I, I really want to do a film with you with horses, maybe a Western, we should do that. And it's like, okay. And then we wrapped Double Threat and she got 1883 and she goes, ah, I found my filmmaker who's got the horses, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks anyway, Shane. I'm I good. I can't compete with this. I can't compete <laughs> with this. Yeah, I felt like Woody Harrelson in uh, Indecent Proposal. It's like, he's got the big yacht. The, just, I can't compete with <laughs> I can't compete with it. Just... Just go. Just I can go. offer you some old vintage guitars. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that he's doing so. Taylor's doing so well that he bought. He's a co-owner now of the the Four Sixes Ranch. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he bought. He bought. The, and for everyone to know, the Four Sixes Ranch is the largest ranch in America. I think it's it's two hundred and seventy-five 275 miles. Yeah, it's it's I, 275 I heard square miles or some something insane. It's and nuts. he owns and he he owns he's a part owner of it now. God bless. I think 200 million or something like that. It's something crazy. <laughs> Must, be nice. Must be nice. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to put gas in the car. <laughs> Hence why I moved why I moved to Austin, sir. Uh, <laughs> smart man, smart man. Now another thing I wanted to ask you about, man, is titles the title of your movie and how important the title of your movie is. And a lot of filmmakers think about it as a creative choice and it is, but a movie like one of the greatest movies ever made worst title ever for a film. What movie is it? Greatest movie ever. One of the greatest movie ever made in the nineties, worst title in the history of cinema. Well, I know, I know it was a, well, for me, it was a best-selling book um, with Shawshank Redemption. That's it. It's a horrible, horrible name. I can Horrible tell name. you a funny story about that movie. Not many people know, but go for um, it. Go for it. I'm a, such a, oh, a shot. Sh- sh- when, when we first started doing gridiron gang, we got that film got acquired by Sony in 92, 93. Mm-hmm. So we spent a lot of years at the studio and without naming names, uh, you know, when you're in the studio system, they'll, they'll invite you to screenings, premieres and little private showings. And I'll never forget being invited to a private showing of a film that the head of production at Sony called and said, we want you guys, you and your dad and mom to come to see this film. So we went and it was it was Shawshank Redemption and it was brilliant. It was like I, I, the, the lights came up. I turned to the gentleman who invited us and I said, one of the best films I've ever seen. He said, we're, we're not that excited about it. We don't know. He said, we're, we're kind of nervous about it. We, it's a little picture we may, nah. And I just, I didn't know it was based on a Stephen King movie because I actually saw it without credits. That's how really mm. I saw it. And I just said to him, I said, my only suggestion is change the title. And everybody looked at me like I just took a turd on the, in, in the corner of the room. And they were like, you realize that's a Stephen King novel. And I was like, oh, I just don't think it's the, not a I, novel. It was a what, short, what it? it was a novella. Oh, was short story. It's a short story <laughs> inside. Oh, uh, it's a novella. So it wasn't like it. You could change the damn title. And it wasn't actually the name of the title of the novella. I anyway. never saw the title. And now I think everybody's it's ingrained in our head. But yeah, but now it's then Shawshank oh, it's, Redemption. It was horrible, horrible. So can you talk about the importance of titles in the marketing and selling of your film? I can. I, I The first time I ever got introduced to the importance of a title, I was fortunate enough um, when I was, I was running Charlie Sheen's production company from 90, I think it was 96 to 99. And we were doing a lot of projects back then. And we got involved with Avi Lerner, who's, you know, Avi's become one of the most mm. prolific independent filmmakers of, you know, content in the world. And we were doing a film uh, and the title was The Sparrow Prophecies. It was kind of this really cool psychological thriller. And um, they greenlit the film and it changed. But Avi said to me in a meeting, I'll never forget it. We didn't have, he called me, he said, we need to have a meeting. We didn't have Skype. We didn't email. We drove to Avi's office. He said, we're having a roundtable meeting about the title. And he said, the title sucks. I don't understand it. But most importantly, it does not translate foreign. He said, on a good day, 18% of our money will come from domestic. It's all about foreign. And I never forgot that. So I was literally in the bathroom. I grabbed an old, uh, I was getting ready to go to the, the, the meeting and I was looking at an old issue of Metal Edge magazine and the drummer for Poison, they're friends of mine, yes. Ricky Rocket was wearing a shirt that said no code of conduct. So I went to the meeting. About two hours later, I'm sitting there and Avi screaming about how horrible the title is. And I finally said, what about no code of conduct? And everybody stopped. He wrote it down. He made a phone call. He hung up. He said, that is brilliant. 
He said, you're good at titles. You're a crappy writer, but you're good at titles. So <laughs> I said to him later as we became friendly, he said, you know, and this was in the home video days, but I, I tell people this now. He said, when people go to Blockbuster or Hollywood video, they start at new releases. They're in alphabetical order. You have to think about by the time they get to M, they've made their selection. He said, so always try to think of, of titles before M, but good two word titles that have translation globally. So for me, I realized in making movies, especially in the last few years, you know, we have, we have titles like break even, we have titles like night train, we have titles like double threat, um, you know, things like that. And, and for me, it's about, let's get a catchy title that we say on a daily basis or a regular, like when we hear it, it's a familiar term. And for me, it's, it's, it's really important to catch people's eye that know nothing about you as a filmmaker. They may not know your actors or what your film's about, or you don't have the publicity money to make it a household name. How can you do that? And that's all the studio system was doing in repeat sequels, prequels, and remakes was let's get rebrand what people know. So as an indie filmmaker, I think it's important to come up with really cool titles that people are familiar with subconsciously that will help just do a little bit of a built-in branding for your film and that's that's where that comes from but as a, as a i can't work on a film until i have a cool title i just i never could it's uh so i actually uh, when i was working in uh coming up doing deliveries for film for films i was working with the distributor and there was a title of a movie and let's say it was called night train all right, let's for for lack of a, it's called night sure. trains. For, right. sure. He goes, yeah, it's too. Uh, can't you can't make that work? Yeah, uh, we need to be in, in the top of the catalog. Yeah. So for him, he was looking at it from AFM standpoint, from the American film market standpoint, where distributors and buyers are looking at the catalog, and it starts at A. So he yeah. renamed the movie A Night Train. Smart. Because they're not going to make it Night Train, comma A in the catalog. It's going to be A Night Train. A Night right. Train. So, and then, I mean, I'm using that as a really horrible yeah. example, but it's exactly what he did. He just took it and just made a, it just threw an A in front of it. And you're just like, but that doesn't sound that great. And he's like, it's going to sell. So sell. there's, and this is the thing, man. And, and I know, I know you and I both kind of fall in the same, in the same boat in this in regards to art versus commerce. We're filmmakers, uh -huh. we're creatives. We want to tell a cool story. We want to be doing what we'd love to do. But then you got to make money in order to keep this train going. No pun intended. To keep this, you got to keep this thing going. So there are going to be sacrifices at this level. When you're at the studio level, and you did the whole other, or if you're in the art world, our art, art film level, where you don't care. Like I made a movie called On the Corner of Ego and Desire. I, it's not something I AFM was not my strand, not my point. It wasn't like buyers are going to buy this. I made the movie for three three grand. It was and your, it was fun. It was your, piece. It was your piece. It was just for fun. And I was going to sell it to my audience and I made money with it and all and we're all said and done. But it was an art piece. It was an art right. piece. So there's art films and then there is a uh, studio world where rules are completely different. They're completely skewed. Oh, yeah. They do whatever they right. want. But in the indie, you know, the grinding indie world in the trenches, if you will, you've got to balance art and commerce. And mm -hmm. you just said that you kind of cut out 20 minutes of your movie or else you wouldn't have gotten deals. Now you could have no. stuck to your guns as an artist and said, you know what? This is my vision. I'm not moving forward. And that movie wouldn't have made money. You wouldn't have been able to make the next one. Is that a fair statement? And that's, and that's just it. I, I say in my book, um, I remind people, you know, I look at every film we make as a gift. Every yes. opportunity opportunity we have i look i compare it to a trip to the moon and how many people have been to the moon twice i don't think many um and i just say look if you just want to make a movie go make the movie you want to make but if you want to have a career as a filmmaker there are sacrifices and things that you have to change to get there i mean i've had films that that it People said are brilliant. They've won, you know, a hundred awards at really prestigious festivals, premiered at Cannes. And then the buyer who buys it at Cannes says, great, we need to take out five minutes. We need to do this. We need to switch this. We don't like this actor. We want you to reshoot that. And, but that's what got me here. I am at 50 plus years old now, and I'm making a couple of films a year. And I'm very pleased to say pretty much my way because I've learned how to play the game. And it is common. Going back to what you said about title real quick, the original title to Night Train was actually Blow and Smoke because it's a film about speed. It's about, you know, car racing and all, motorcycles and all this well, Blow stuff. Blow and Smoke, I th uh, right, right away I thought of, I thought it was a weed movie. 
there, okay, so it first was a weed, then there was blowing smoke up your ass. And then I, I literally said as a joke, I said, well, the, the treatment title was Night Train. And everybody's like, well, that's your title. Night Train, the truck is actually your third star in the movie. That's the brand. That's, plus you got the Guns N' Roses song that was real familiar, uh, popular. So it's, again, it goes back to that subtle branding. So yeah, we scrapped Blowing Smoke, even though that was the working title. Uh, but it was always meant to be nitrate. Yeah, exactly. Now I want to ask you, how did you get double thread off the ground? You know, and especially how did you get the, you know, how did you just, I mean, obviously you came up with the idea. You, you wrote it, correct? No, no, no. CJ Wally. No, you didn't it, craziest story. So uh, we were in September of 2020. We had all been on lockdown for six, seven months. I was sitting in my home office and I literally said, okay, it's September coming into the fourth quarter. We can look in a rear view mirror and say 2020 kicked our ass and locked us down or we can, we can turn around and make it our bitch. I said, I am not going down without a fight. A friend of mine called me. He was one of my dearest friends in the world. He said, Hey, um, I got 50 grand burning a hole in my pocket. Can you do something with it? And I said, sure. So I called up CJ and I said, I got a friend who just committed 50 grand. I know it's nothing. I got the cameras for free. I know I can get the locations for free. The actors will just put it under an experimental deal. We'll get decent actors. Somebody will come out and play with us. We'll get a crew of eight. Let's just go do it. So we talked to Danielle and her manager at the time, Kurt, and we all agreed to go make this movie. CJ had us a script in six days. And wow. on the sixth day of Christmas, my true love called me and said, yeah, my wife said, no, you're not getting a 50 grand. So it was like, oh, okay. So I actually was having lunch the next day with the, one of my dearest friends in the world. And uh, it was when they were starting to let people in restaurants, if they were outside on streets and we sat down and he just said, you know, um, I told you I'd never get involved in your industry. He's a very successful man in his own business. He said, I'm concerned about you and your friends. You haven't been out of the house in seven months. He said, what is the cheapest you can make a movie for like bare bones, with the COVID protocols, I don't want you to get shut down. So I came back to him later that day and said, I've broken down what we were going to do. Here's what COVID's going to cost. Let's put a little pad in there. Let's do it right. Let's do it through SAG. Let's do it. Pay everybody. Here's the number. And he said, I want you to get out of the house and go make a movie. And within two months from concept to that's a wrap. Wow. Yeah. That's an insane turnaround for a movie of yeah. that size and magnitude. Now, the best part of the story is not. Um, I had two assistant editors on the film who sadly lost parents, grandparents, and brothers and sisters to COVID. Right. So right. I had I had all the 4K or 5K footage sitting. I couldn't find anybody because Hollywood had started to open and we had no money going in. It took me six months to get the, the picture transcoded sunk dailies proxies and cut because everybody was back to work and making good money and we didn't have post money going in and i literally had to ship a hard drive a 24 terabyte hard drive to cairo egypt there was a gentleman god love him uh he he heard we were in need he reached out and said i am stuck in egypt i flew here before the pandemic with my wife we cannot leave we're on lockdown if you trust me, I will deliver what you need. And I literally FedExed to Cairo a 24 terabyte high drive. And a month later, he sent it back with everything done. And we were able to wow. start home. Affordably, I'm assuming. It, he did it for like lunch, a screen credit and a new friend. I mean, the guy, I couldn't have done it without him. Wow. Couldn't have done it. We had no post money. We put it all into the shoot and COVID. 40 grand went to COVID on that film. We That's tested ridiculous. over 400 times, not one positive. We had a, a couple of COVID officers and all the, the PPE stuff you needed. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable what went to COVID. Like a huge chunk of the movie went to COVID. 
Wow. That's yeah. so we posted it for nothing. I mean, my DP, Joel Leogan, colored it because he wanted to color a film. He said, I'd like to try coloring a film. And I said, Well, I have no money here. <laughs> and these are the things you and, the, and when you're when you're working at this budget level, you gotta do what you gotta do to make it happen. There's no yeah. just, just and it was just it was reason. it was a fraction of what we had been used to. So and then you add COVID on top of it, and then the fact that when we were in post, everybody was back to work. I was calling people that were friends of friends that were looking for work the week before and destitute living in a box. And as we all know, Hollywood went crazy. And um, I would call people and like colorists that would say, yeah, I'll do it for like five. But they were like, dude, you can't even afford me. I'm backed up for six months. Don't even bother me. I couldn't get anybody to do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And oh, I was getting calls left and right to do color. And I just like, I'm retired. <laughs> I'm retired. I'm I'm a podcaster, sir. I don't I don't color. No, I'm joking. Um, I, I actually had a friend, Chris Rossiter, who's one of my dearest friends. I love Chris. He's an incredible cinematography teacher at uh, um, LACC. Mm-hmm. Chris is a very good colorist, and he had been on lockdown, so he had actually offered when we went into this. He goes, "If you ever get in a jam and need it colored, let me know. I'll color it for you for lunch and you know a couple of favors." And I said, "Great," but the problem was it took us four and a half months to get it transcoded and synced. So by the time I got the film back and Frank Reynolds and I started cutting the film, Chris was already back teaching, working full time again. So I lost that window and it was like starting and thank God my DP said he'd color it. It's, it's pretty, it's a, it's an, it's an insane thing we do. I don't even know why we do it. Honestly, it's it's, it's, it's insanity. I question it every time. (laughs) Now you, you obviously been able to raise money from investors over the years to get your movies and projects off the ground. What are a few reasons why investors want to invest in our, in our industry and in, in your project specifically? What are a few things that we can kind of know on how to, you know, angle our pitches or, you know, just angle what we're trying to do with them? You know, that's a great question. And I have found, you know, I think for filmmakers for many years, it was getting rich people that wanted to rub elbows with celebrities. Those days are over. Um, it's, it's about relationships and people don't like hearing this, especially the young ones coming up who are of that, that instant satisfaction, get it when you want it age of picking up the phone and ordering something from Amazon and having it or being able to text somebody you can't reach. Um, and I talk about it in my book, Alex. The key thing is relationships. The people that have invested in me over the years, with the exception of one, maybe two times in 30 years, were people that I had known for decades, most in which said, never, never talk to me about investing in film. I will never do it. It, it, It's and everybody wants to hear it's going to a cocktail party and meeting a rich guy who wants to rub elbows with, as they say in the player with Whoopi Goldberg and make, you know, write a check. And that's not how it works. It's, it's, um, it's about building trust. They, they want to know that they can trust you. You have to treat their money like it's your own. Uh, for me, many times it, it was working for these people in side hustle jobs, or they had a need and they needed something handled professionally that they didn't know who to call on. So they called on me and said, I, I, I need something done for my business. Nobody's available. So it would turn into me doing a three month job for them that they looked back and said, this guy didn't fail me. He did what nobody else could do. And he delivered. And, and I, this is how he's conducting himself and his business. I want in. And that's what it became for me. And, and um, with the exception of running into two or three people in the course of 30 years that said, Hey, I want to be in the business. I like what you do. Here's a check. Um, it's been about deep seated, long lasting friendships that were never built on maybe one day they'll write a check for a movie. And that I think is the hardest thing to translate to people. Uh, you'll always meet people that say, I know somebody they may be interested or uh, I'm a hedge fund manager. I know people, or my favorite is, is, you know, I have clients that are deep, deep pockets and they're interested in getting in the industry and, you know, put a proposal together. Um, I think pitch decks, and I talk about this a lot. I think pitch decks have to be reality checks for a lot of people pitch decks especially for filmmakers who haven't done it they 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 put these figures together that are so (laughs) methodic i mean it's like great mythology how they put you know maybe back in the old heyday of blockbuster and hollywood video these things may have worked but it's a new day and age the mgs are tiny if you get them at all I always remind the filmmakers, you've got 54 territories and over 170 countries that potentially could buy your film. Quit making movies for Instagram red carpet moments and think globally, not locally when it comes to building 
something. Amen, brother. And Amen. stop putting Ben Affleck and, you know, Gal Gadot in your pitch deck. It's not going to happen. And, and, you know, and all you're doing <laughs> is I talk about is all you're doing is disappointing your potential investor. Why would you go in with these names to try to lure them? And then before you've even started shooting the movie, hey, you got some B-rate actor that nobody knows. No disrespect to them, but it sure doesn't add up to Gal Gadot and Ben Affleck. So your investor is going to look at that and go, well, why did you present this? And you're ending up with that. And, and, let's, and let's not even talk about projections and, you know, yes. busting out Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity. Oh, and Sling Blade Dynamite. and Napoleon Dynamite. Dynamite yeah. and El Mariachi. <laughs> oh, my God. I always tell people, look at Lovely and Amazing <laughs> once. These little films that were made for a half a million dollars that made back four once. million dollars. Once. Yeah, once is a great one. Yeah, once is a great, great example. One. And and I tell people, it's like, look, if I'd like to think that us filmmakers are smart enough to be creative beings and should have some business sense. And what, what frustrates me is I see them look, if, if you're a potential investor and somebody came to you and said, dude, I need a hundred grand. We can build, buy this house and flip it in six months and make you 30 million bucks. Are you, you going to give that guy a hundred grand? Probably not. But if the guy came to you and said, I need a hundred grand, it's going to take us 10 months to, to remodel. And Probably in the next two to three years, we can sell that house for 250 to 300 grand. Is that something you'd be interested in? You may actually listen to them. And that's what filmmakers forget. And remember, when you're going to somebody with a lot of money or the potential to finance your dream, chances are they're smarter than you are. And they have people in their camp that earn a living protecting them from people like us. And you have to lay it out. It's like, you know, I learned at a very young age, don't don't BS and, and build this picture of, of, of total fantasy go in with the mindset is you're going to get a base hit an occasional double if you ever get a grand slam hallelujah but that can't be what you're selling because it's lightning in a bottle oh yeah i mean if you're always if, if you're if, if, if you only look at the home runs and not the not the bunts and the singles and that's what most and that's what most filmmakers do they they look at the best case scenario they never look at the worst case scenario or the gen like it's one out of a, a thousand, one out of 10,000, you know, do that kind of big kind of money that blows out the onces and the, and the, I mean, paranormal activities once in a, once a decade, you know? Yeah. But how many millions did Paramount put into that movie? Seven. Yeah. And I, and I know, and I know the guys who, who I mean, who worked on that, you know, and, I know and, the and, people at Paramount who acquired it. <laughs> right. Exactly. So we know, I knew the stories behind them. Like, Oh yeah. They pumped a ton of cash into this. So it wasn't like, it's like mariachi. Like, Oh yeah. It was a $7,000 movie that made 3 million of the box office. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, they did spend a little bit of money remastering it. They put a little money into marketing, uh, you know, you know, but that's that. That's not that. Doesn't serve the narrative. It doesn't serve no, the narrative. No, it doesn't. And and I think the days of those sling blades and Napoleon dynamites, because there were the Miramaxes and the Hollywood videos and blockbuster outlets that these little gems found found life and they flourished. It's, you know? it's, I mean, it's I, mean, I, I man, I can't even think. We haven't had anything like that happen. Like a movie out of nowhere with no stars. Real nowhere, not. Not the deal was already done. Let's send it to Sundance and we'll announce no. our deal. like literally nowhere. nowhere, no no talent in the in the movie or like barely any no bankable stars, no nothing, like a Napoleon Dynamite style, like that goes off and makes fifty million dollars or Brothers McMullen, yeah, that There's that went off and made thirty million dollars with no but like literally nobody. nobody. It was a student Maybe, project, practically. Yeah, yeah. Ed just put that thing together. Those, I don't know if that's even possible today in that in the way it was then, because the marketplace was different. There was a marketplace for indie films, and that's the big thing that a lot of people don't understand is there was in the '90s an infrastructure being built for independent films. The DVD market was huge. There were still Hollywood videos and blockbusters are running around. You know. Rick, when he was on the show, Rick Linkletter, when he was talking about Slacker, he's like, the reason why Slacker found the made money is because there was an infrastructure starting to be built in the early 90s. There were indie movies in the 80s. There was really, you know, great art, you know, independent filmmakers that made great films in the 80s and in the 70s. But there wasn't the infrastructure to make money with them. The Easy Rider was like the 
you know, and it still had Jack freaking Nicholson and, and Dennis Hopper in it. And, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, back then. And that was considered indie. But there were still independent filmmakers making movies back then, but there wasn't the infrastructure. So right. in the 90s, there was this groundswell of, 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 of places you could put movies and actually make money. Art house theaters. Every studio had an indie arm. Paramount yep. Vantage. Yep. You know, Fox 2000. All of those, all of yep. those things um, were around for that. And that's where that it's all kind of gone away. There's only a handful of those left Fox, Fox searchlight, or excuse me, just searchlight films now. Yep. And, um, and Sony picture classics. And now they're not doing indies. They're nope. doing big budget, you know, with big stars. Yeah. Like under 10 million. Big yeah. stars under 10 million. So that's 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 it's the- a totally different animal. And we don't have, you know, it's funny is because I, I have a lot of friends in the music industry. And when Napster and file sharing became really big, I remember I went yeah. to a friend's house who had had a, a record release party and he played some of the songs that he had on his record. And I and he'd had a lot of success. And I remember saying, dude, this is this is huge. And he said to me, he said, let me tell you something. He said, music is free. He said, now music is free. We don't make our money on music. We make money on touring. And he said, I'm worried about your industry because you guys don't tour. And I thought, oh, that was interesting. And as I look now, we're kind of, so many of us are giving our movies to streaming platforms for nothing. And we don't have an after party to keep people excited. Like an artist can go out, they can do an album in their home studio, may cost them a few grand and they put it out and they get a few singles on it that circulate on iTunes or YouTube, but they're giving that out and we're all sharing the links to it for, to friends. So they're really not getting a lot of money on it, but they can go out and tour and make 50, 60, 80, hundred grand a night for three or four months. That's their follow. What do we have? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it's something I think about often. Well, I do have the answer. It was in my book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, sir, where you create, multiple revenue streams and product lines based on your movie. Now it doesn't work for every kind of movie, every kind of story, but if you design it around that, it is a possibility. And there are examples of filmmakers giving the movie away as a a loss leader to bring them into their funnels to make money other ways. And I feel that, Honestly, I feel that that's really the future of independent filmmaking. I do truly believe it's brilliant. And you are a trailblazer with that and have always been really good at marketing and building a brand. Um, When you're when you're you don't have the brand such as, you know, IFH Academy or whatever you can build. It's and you're just you're going from film to film to film to film. It's often difficult. It's It's a different thing. It's a it, it's a different way of looking at film. So like I can't I don't think that you know you're not going to be selling double threat T-shirts. Generally speaking, it's not that kind of. Oh, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sorry, you are going to be selling double threat T-shirts, making COVID our pitch again. Twenty twenty. I'm not selling them. It was our. I, you I know. know I was CJ designed it, and Kurt had them printed up for it. That's amazing. That's amazing. But generally, but generally speaking, sure. like not every movie is is set up for a film entrepreneur model. But as a filmmaker, you're going to go, okay, how can I build a sustainable business? If I like a certain genre, can I can I build a brand around horror movies, like Bloom, like Blumhouse? Can you build a brand around action movies and like really brand it so people know that? Is it possible? Yeah, it's. I'm not saying it's easy. But it's no, I mean, for us, it's it's kind of taking the Hal Needham approach of the 70s and early 80s of that smoking yeah. the of cannibal run and, and flipping it where we're putting the women in the driver's seat and the guys are riding shotgun. And that's kind of what we've been doing these last three or four years. And it's been really exciting. It's like, but, but you're right. It's like we had break even during the pandemic, shot double threat. I've already shot Night Train prepping another film. But here I am promoting double threat. But I'm already thinking about Night Train and how we're going to market that. I mean, it's 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 constant. And so they work together a little bit, but yeah, I know, I, I know. Now I have to ask you on the casting side. Yeah, um, Double Threat. I mean, has a great cast. You know, uh, uh, Matt Lawrence and I. You know, I worked with them before. He's, he's I love, all the Lawrence boys are great. I love them. I'm going to be with him Friday. I love Matt. No, Matt, Matt t- tell him please tell Matt I said hi, Austin, I Austin, and I. Austin and I say hi. Uh, I, I did a I did a little work with him a little while ago, but um, but generally speaking, nobody in your movie is this giant bankable star. Uh, so yeah, so they're not like you know not bringing huge money in, but they're good actors, and that's great. So 
how did you get this? Is the movie itself, the genre and the trailer and, and what you've put together, is that the star that helps sell the film? It, you know what it was? It, it basically was the fact that we've got this lovely girl, Danielle C. Ryan, who's five foot two, soaking wet with a full moon. And <laughs> she does all her own stunts. And she's actually a really good actor. She's actually the star of Night Train. And um, we, you know, that film was so different. And we got really blessed with Donald Labiri and Matthew Lawrence and Kevin Joy, you know, was, it was somebody that um, one of the producers found and, and had known and he was great. But yeah, the, it was, it was like, look, we, we know what we're dealing with. I mean, before we had cast some of the people that we did, we were making calls to some really respectable, bankable quote unquote names. And we didn't even get past the hi, how you doing? We're doing a film. And they said, dude, call us back when COVID's over because if they were bankable and they had that kind of scratch that they didn't need to work, they weren't coming out of the house. And no disrespect to who we did get because they've all had tremendous careers and are doing very well. But what was really cool is Don Olivieri had called her agent three days before we called her. And she said, I know there are some crazy some bitches out there that are mavericks that are thumbing her nose to locking themselves in the house anymore. Find me somebody respectable who's making a movie. So when we called Don's agent, she said, oh, my God, Don just called me two days ago saying find something. And the problem is, is there aren't many people out there making movies. So we got really lucky. Similar with Matthew Lawrence. Matthew had been tired of being locked up uh, for six, seven months and is a filmmaker and producer at heart. And he was all about getting out and making art. And so we got really fortunate. I wouldn't trade one actor in that film for anybody in the world. I couldn't be more proud of that cast, but for us, you know, for me, and I, uh, it's, it's look, when you're working in indie film, you're not going to go get the A-listers, you know, I'll never forget when I was doing my film at Sony, when we, when we were simmering down, they said, hey, anything you get attached with Vince Vaughn, you have a go picture. And that tells you the power that an actor may have. At a of time. course. Well, when you're making films for half a million dollars, you don't get those kind of actors. So what I always try to do, and I talk about it in, in the book extensively, is um, get actors that people are familiar with. They, they may not be riding the biggest wave today, but at one point in their career, they were or think globally again it's like i know matthew lawrence has done mrs doubtfire he's done boy meets world i look at somebody like uh don olivieri who was in you know uh house of cards and um or house of lies forgive me and heroes these shows are being syndicated in 100 countries right now so just because we may not recognize the name or face immediately doesn't mean globally oh. these people aren't on tv three or four times a day and they're still stars and that's how I cast my movies. Yeah, and that's that's a really smart way of going about it because they might not look like, oh, well, it doesn't look like somebody I know or this and that. But what has she done? Was she a big star in a, in a, in a show for eight seasons? Or did they do some other big studio movies at one point and their name is still people recognize or see their face and they recognize it? If the budget level, so it depends on the budget level. So, you know, if your budget level is starting to go to three, four, five, six million, you have to get bankable names to be responsible to the investors. Is it if I mean, you're if you're making a five million dollar film, you better allocate two million dollars large to one or two stars to justify what you're spending. You have That's to the way it trust me. I, I have this discussion with buyers, distributors, and other filmmakers. That- I got a lot of friends with a lot of $5 million movies. They can't even get looked at because they miscast it. And that's scary. I'll tell you, there was a movie I I worked on years ago. I did the, I did all the post on it, finished it up, had no stars in it. They went out to the marketplace. Everyone said, sorry, you got nobody in it. It's, I know it's a sci-fi action thing. Don't care. Went back. He, he raised another 50, 60 grand, a hundred grand, something like that. Got two stars. I think he got like one of the guys from Stargate, the show Smart. Stargate. Smart. Smart. And it's a, it's a sci-fi thing. And he got Michael Madsen for a day each. Yep. Shot him out, re-edited the movie, reinserted the new scenes. I I he came back to me like eight months later. He's like, Hey, can can we can we redo the movie? I'm like, What do you what, what do you do? He's like, Oh, okay. We did that. He packaged it, put him on the cover, went back to the marketplace, and they said, We'll take it. I, I will tell you, I had a friend years ago who did a film. Uh, he spent 500000 of his own money on it, shot it in 35 millimeter. Woo-hoo! And couldn't get it looked at. It was just, it was his friends and locals in another state. 
and he brought it to California and it wasn't a bad film. It just didn't have anybody in it. And it was the exact same story. Somebody said, if you can put a star or two in a scene and reshoot a scene or two, you may, you may get somewhere. I know to date, this film has generated over $4 million for him because he just went out and got, he, we literally went into a studio and shot one actor, replaced an actor from another scene with, with a known actor, paid him, you know, probably 15, 20 grand for the day. Yep. And then he went out and got another cameo for a guy to play an arresting officer. To date, that film has made over $4 million for him. And this was a film that nobody looked at for 18 months. They were just like, dude, I, I don't even need to see it. Nobody wanted it. And that's the importance of a bankable, a bankable name. So, and, and again, it's not, and I've said this so many times on the show, and I think I have to say it again for people to understand. It's not out of reach for to shoot somebody out in a day, 15, 10, five grand a day, 10 grand a day, 20 grand a day for an eight or 10 hour day is you're going to get that money back tenfold if you're smart. And it's so important and filmmakers just don't think they could one, they don't have the confidence to think that they can get it done. Yep. But I, I, I've, I've just seen it. I'm working with people right now, some clients that are doing it currently and they're going out to the, to the talent. They're like, here's how much I have. Okay. Let's do this. Let's do that. Great. I need you for five hours, five hours to shoot out scenes for this movie. Can you do it? And I worked on a movie that had, um, Sean Patrick Flannery um, mm-hmm. from Boondocks yeah, uh, and, and, and Young Indiana Jones and a million other things, right? So they do so brilliant. They shot him out in one day because uh, that's the whole movie. He's in the entire movie. He's not just in one scene. They yeah, peppered they have to be him. careful now. Yeah. They, pep- they peppered him throughout the movie. So he's in like six or seven scenes, but they're all in the same place. So in other words, he's the cop that they come back to, like, to meet with and they always meet at the, at the parking garage. So they just shot the parking garage just change your shirt change your shirt spreads the hair and yeah. and and, they, and he dropped dropped him in and he was just and he's on the cover so and they that's shot him out for a day and they and then you've got him now you've got a marketable movie and that's yeah. the that's the way filmmakers need to think especially in a commerce-based film art yeah. house different conversation and and you know what? Let me let me cap that by saying I have a somebody that was brought to to my life a couple of years ago who shot a film with three A list, well known stars and couldn't get anybody to look at the film, and it was content. It was content, and that was heartbreaking because this guy actually spent a million and a half dollars. But what was the content? What was wrong with the content? It, it, well, there's you know there's two rules in a movie: don't kill a kid and don't kick a dog anymore, right? And uh, he killed the kid it, and killed the dog. It, well, they killed the kid and kicked the dog, and and that was it's like, dude. And but it was also involving sexual assault to a child. And it's like, no, 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 no. What are you fucking nuts? No, I mean, no. You got these actors who have like two of the actors generated over three billion in the box office on their work. And they agreed to do this and you wasted this bullet and they, they can't even get it looked at because it's, it's based on a true story that everybody knows. And they're like, yeah, no, we ain't touching that. So might don't, as well, don't forget might, content either. Might, might as well uh, throw some religion and politics in there. If you will. Oh, I, I, absolutely love that. Might as well. Might as well. Everybody might loves well. that. Oh, let's talk about religion and politics while we're at it. I mean, it's, Oh my God, that's so heartbreaking. But that's the kind, but that's the kind of stuff that happens all the time. Yeah. Hey, we got the cast. We missed. We missed the 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 content. Hey, we got the content. We didn't get cast. I just think as indie rats, we have to we have to think again. You say it so brilliantly. Is is commerce, business, and 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 art, and and how do you find that? And it's 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 about you know. I remember I had a film that that had the green light before the EO7 crash, which thank God it didn't happen because it was it would have been miscast. We had a lot of A-list actors getting it. One of the big agencies was packaging it and they had some serious cats wanting to get on board. And um, I was adamant about uh, the lead being an unknown. I was adamant about it because of her meager world in the script. I didn't want somebody looking at like Jennifer Aniston and the good girl going, yeah, she makes a million dollars an episode is, you know, when you're watching this girl who works in a, in a mini mart who's supposedly broke, but it's, it's headline news everywhere that the stars of friends are making a million dollars an episode. I didn't want that. I didn't want that to taint it. So I was adamant about an unknown. And I remember a head of a studio brought me into his office and he said, you're, you're digging a grave. You have a film that 
you have everybody clamoring to do that is bankable and respectable, yet you want to hang it on and know you're never going to get this movie past go. And he was right. He was right. So let me ask you then, how did you get the distribution for this? How, what is the distribution? How are you? Oh, for double threat? Yeah. It, yeah. it was really simple. You know, look, it was really simple. We knew, we knew domestically that we would be looking at a VOD situation. We didn't, we didn't huff our own farts on this one. We didn't, uh, you know, have any delusions of grandeur. It was this fun little dirt movie we made with our friends and kicked ass and took no prisoners and it is what it is. And so it was one of those things where it was about partnering with somebody who captured the vision. We wanted a woman run company to be behind the film because we are women driven in our storytelling and VMI is, is it's got a wonderful group that runs that company and they happen to be some wonderful, lovely ladies and they saw it and they just fell in love with it. They just love the idea of a woman out there kicking ass riding a horse bareback and shooting somebody with a bow and arrow, uh, you know, having the fight scenes that she does. And it just was one of those things, Alex, where for us, a lot of times it's not about the dollars up front. It's about what is the passion and commitment somebody's going to have to putting a product out. That was most important. And fortunately for us, you know, the film is, is new. So it went to Cannes. Uh, piggybacking with Night Train and we're starting to sell up the globe now, which is really exciting because it is a fun action comedy without slapstick comedy that sometimes doesn't translate for and it's physical comedy and you can always do well with that. So it's, it's got the combination of, of, of some, some fun action sex uh, horses, fights, airplanes, and and some love, and and you know road road type movies. So uh, it, we're starting to see that it's it's translating very well across the globe. And you're you've already started selling out different territories. Oh, I think we got twelve, thirteen territories since camp. That's amazing, man. And That's and amazing. yeah, some really some really good. I mean, you know, talking about Germany, China, or not? No, I'm sorry, not uh, Germany, China, South, China. No, 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 no. Uh, Japan, South Korea, Germany. You know, yeah. South America. I mean, it's like I looked at something that came out yesterday. I was like, God dang, this seems like starting to move. This is exciting. So the UK, um, yeah, and that's just based on us just going out there with a cool trailer and some fun art. And unfortunately, and I'll address it, you know, we came out a week after, two weeks after the the tragedy in in Olvi, and um, that was a big problem because we had already started putting out the the artwork, and that was something that we all you know, realize that that's something that in hindsight, we wish we would have not, you know, you don't know what you don't know going in, but, you know, having your star with an AR-15 on the poster a week after that tragedy is not the best marketing tool, but the, the horse was already out of the barn. There's nothing we could have done. Yeah. And, and that's the thing too. You like, there's just elements and there's variables of, of uh, in filmmaking that you just don't know that could be good okay. or bad. Something like what you just said, obviously is a negative light, but then all of a sudden, your star gets picked up and is, is like going to be the new Marvel movie. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh, wait a minute. Now this property is worth a whole lot more because our star is going to be on a big show or a big thing. So you just, these are variables you just can't plan for. So you kind of, kind of have to roll with it and see, unfortunately, it, uh, yeah, unfortunately and, see what happens. And unfortunately there's the, the gunplay in the movie is minimal and it's all justified. Good guys versus bad guys. It's not anything like that. No, no, no. Bad. Jackson. But you can't, Stranger Things. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Remember oh, Stranger oh. Things, right? Remember Stranger Things, right? The new Stranger yeah, Things oh. series. The, the opening, the opening sequence. They like literally put a thing out, like, "Hey, this might be a problem." The opening of um, of uh, Obi Wan Kenobi. Same thing. You, they're like, "This might," you know. They made those. They made those shows years, like a year ago. We like, made Double Threat in November, December of twenty. The key art was done six, seven months ago. Eight right, months exactly. ago. Exactly. Shell, we knew it was coming out in June of 2022. I've I made it two movies since then. It was like out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, it is what it is. So you just have to kind of, you know, roll with the um, roll yeah. with the punches in that sense. I want you to discuss something for me. Can you please debunk the myth of streamers and the that there, there's so much money to be made by independent, they're buying, Netflix is buying movies from independent filmmakers left and right. They're writing checks like They are writing crazy. checks. They are writing checks. Not sure. to us, but not, not to us. us. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I will give you two examples. I have a friend who is a very, very respected filmmaker that made an independent film for $800,000. They made back when Netflix was spending 
They made a deal with Netflix for 250 grand. Once it went on Netflix, nobody nobody else would look at it because, oh, you're on Netflix, bye. So it made an $850,000 movie, made back 250. But Netflix pays, I think, over the course of two years. They pay it in quarterly installments, plus you've got your 20% sales commission fee. So, and their deliverables, which are going to cost you more because they're not in a standard deliverable. So you may see out of that 250, they may see $175,000 over the course of two years. Um, and then I have a friend, I, I got to be careful how I talk about this. He had a number one show on Netflix, uh, during the pandemic. They, they, he's made nothing and is pitching on a regular basis to them and other streamers to hopefully get another movie made. Um, and he had a number one, number one hit on Netflix during the pandemic. And he's like, dude, it, it barely covered the cost of deliverables. And that's and that's the and that's the thing and that's the thing I want people to hear it because everyone's like oh you gotta get on Netflix you gotta get on Netflix no you don't we, no, we, you we don't, don't look I got on my first one got on Hulu which is an insanity how my five thousand dollar movie got picked up by Hulu that's great it was a but it was a different time it was it was probably six seven years ago when Hulu wasn't it doing was it. it was twenty twenty seventeen okay. Five, it was twenty. Five, it was twenty seventeen. So it was twenty seventeen, and you know, and I also sold it to China. So there, that's how old that is. So because China was buying at that point. Yeah, China was like, that, that. That door is closed. <laughs> that door. That door is closed right now. But that that door was open, and I made good money on both of those, uh, so those cool. both of those sales. It was great. But it's not what. And by the way, if I didn't make a five thousand dollar movie, that Hulu deal wouldn't have really been made a whole lot of sense. But because I made a five thousand dollar movie, it was like. <laughs> Of course. And you learned been- a lot in the process, which is what we talked about earlier in my background of doing that $500, 45-minute pilot. That did more for my career than anything than anything uh, that I've done. And you're right. And, and that's the thing is I always – it's like so funny when I talk to people, whether they're people not in the business or people coming out, like, are you making a deal with Netflix? Are you, are you doing Netflix? It's like, huh, no. <laughs> no, but that's, yeah. but, that's, but that's a little secret for everybody who's not in the know. Yep. Everyone thinks that like, oh, you got to be on on the major streamers. Amazon's not buying anything. Nope. Um, and 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 if you get on HBO Max, you're you've got to have some major star power. And I and I've spoken to filmmakers who have their films bought, but then I'm like, oh, but you have this guy who was in a Marvel movie, who's the lead in a Marvel movie, yeah, who's a, who's about to explode in their movie. That's yeah. probably one of the reasons. And it also covered a bunch of other boxes that they wanted to check off. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. And you, that you, and again, it goes back to how you package market and cast and content and what you're putting together, as we talked about before. But I, the streaming world, especially in North America, is very tough. I, is, that's why I always tell filmmakers, think about your casting, think global, and realize you're making a movie for 54 territories in 100 and something countries that potentially can buy. Because, you know, the, I think the average is what, 18 to 22 percent of a film's revenue comes from North America. But when you're an indie rat it could be as little as four to 6%. And that's something to remember. And that means that there are still are parts of the world that are buying brick and mortar video, DVD, Blu-ray. It's still out there. And there are small theaters around the country or I'm forgiving, not the country, around the world that'll gladly put your movies in there. It, it, oh. does, exist. it does exist. It's just, it's not here and it's not sexy. You know, again, it's what I was saying earlier is stop making your movies for Instagram likes. That's not, it's not all about the bullshit red carpet that you've put up on the side of Reseda Boulevard that's duct taped by your buddy to try to get people. That's not why we're making movies. It's a business. Think global. Get your head out of the San Fernando Valley in West LA and start thinking about the world. And that's what I try to impress upon young filmmakers. Yeah. And and, and I understand exactly what you're talking about because I lived in LA for 13 years. So I know exactly what you're talking about. But a lot of filmmakers who, even if they're not in LA, they think that that's making it. And they're trying to like, you got to look at, God, I mean, you just walk around AFM, man, and you can see who are the real filmmakers who are making money. Yeah. I don't care if your movies are good or not. That's not a, that's not the question here. That's, nope. that's, are art. you making money? Are you making money? Are you making money? And then you as a filmmaker, whoever's listening out there, you have to ask yourself the question, what kind of films do you want to make? Do you want right. to make films that is a, a personal piece, a backyard, uh, a backyard film, if you will, that's personal to you? Do that and make it for as cheap as possible and understand it's art. And hopefully you can make maybe some money back, maybe somewhere, go on the festival tour to see what happens. You're rolling yeah. the dice on that. But 
that's not a business. That's no. art. That's art. And as my brother, as my brother reminds you, you want to be an artist, go paint in the park on Saturday. <laughs> that's his motto. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Go exactly. But if you want to make a business and you want to do what you love to do and do it consistently for a decade or two, you have to think of commerce. You have to think of the business. If you don't, you're not you're just not gonna make it, man. And yeah. that, you know, that's one of the reasons why most people don't even build careers in this business because they have delusions of grandeur, delusions of what they think is supposed to happen, but they don't look at the reality of what is as opposed to what they want it to be. And here's another thing that I I really try to remind a lot of of up and comers about is this world we're living in now. You know how everybody talks about how, why is time going so fast? Well, it's simple. It's because we can't keep up with the news. By the time something, it's, it's like tragic. You look at the shooting in Buffalo. By the time the dust settled on that, there was another one in a church here in Anaheim. Then there was the, the big school shooting. There's There was five that following week. My point is, think about how fast the, the news we move from, from thing to thing to thing. It's worse in film. When your buddy is putting up a trailer of their movie, their buddies are already looking at five other trailers. And by the time you send it out once, it's already buried. And it's really hard to get the traction. You you really, the traction is not something that we have anymore. It used to be, you know, back in, up until five years ago, you put a trailer on Facebook or YouTube, man, that thing got tons of hits. People were emailing you about it for weeks or months. You get, you get, you know, two or 300, maybe a thousand likes in a couple of days, they can't see the movie. They're just buried with everything else. They come home and it's like, oh, honey, the boys is back on or Stranger Things is back on or, you know, you guys found a new Taylor uh, Sheridan film or something. It's like you as indie filmmakers, you can't keep up with the machine that is spoon feeding the, the world with tens of millions of dollars in PA. So you have to think globally and where is your film going to stick? Right, exactly. And then again, back to the film entrepreneur method is focusing on a niche helps mm-hmm. with that. It helps with cutting through the noise. 100%. If you can if you can attach to an emotional n- niche that you're into, then you have a much better fighting chance because there, you know, there I don't know how many surf movies there are made every day, but or how many skateboarding movies are made every day. It's not a huge genre, but it's a huge market and there's a lot of people who are looking for those, you know, I remember when gleaming the cube came out, remember gleaming yeah. the cube oh, yeah. back in the eighties, yeah. 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 like late eighties, I think it was 89 with, with Christian Slater or rad with the, the BMX bike movie. Oh that yeah. Just got re- that just got re-released. Or winner takes all for motocross in the eighties. That's a huge I mean, yeah. film that's unwatchable. <laughs> right. Exactly. But those movies, focused on a niche audience and everybody was like, Oh my God, did you see gleaming the cube? It's a skateboarding movie. Or yeah. You can, you can make noise with an independent film with no budget and even no marketing money in a niche. You have a chance, you have a fighting chance to cut through the noise. Well, especially in a niche, like you're talking about, like imagine getting on all the Facebook skateboarding, BMX, Facebook groups. Yeah. I mean, like I, I, I'm a big motocross guy. Um, you know, it was my life for 30, 40 years. And it's like, I belong to these, these little pages on Facebook and there's like 300,000 members. Oh, there. and then that's one of 12 that I'm a member of. And then you go and there's 20,000 here, a hundred thousand there. Can you imagine if you did a little niche movie for a skateboarder BMX and that group got behind it, what damage you could do? You got to think that's brilliant. I mean, that's how you have to think. But that's how, and I've used multiple examples of that in my book because it's exactly how you do it. It's the only, it's the only weapon we have as independent filmmakers to really compete against the big boys. Because, <laughs> like, and I, and I use the I use the example all the time. There was a documentary about vegan athletes that I I saw. The one with Schwarzenegger and, and yeah, it was uh, Game Changers. Game Changers, right? And I was dying to see it. And no matter what was around, any big Hollywood movie, any billions of dollars that they spend in advertising. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. I want to see this. It cut through all the yeah. marketing. I'll get to your billion. I'll get to the next which a Bond film. Don't I worry. need to see this film. This is the first on my list because I had an emotional attachment to see that. I wanted to see that. So if you can do that as a filmmaker, it's it's a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, it's smart. it's smart. Now, uh, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, sir. I ask all of my guests. Uh-oh. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? My advice to filmmakers trying to break into the business today is uh, first make 
nurture, harvest relationships. Whether you're meeting a sound guy on a shoot or you're meeting a hair and makeup girl on a shoot, my film family runs longer than 25, 30 years with a lot of us. And those are because of relationships that were made. And I say that, are my hair and makeup team or my sound guy writing the checks to finance my movies? No, but they've got my back and I couldn't do it without them. So I think the most important thing is besides shooting and screwing a lot of things up and making yourself better, um, relationships for me are always number one. What did you learn from your biggest failure? What I learned from my biggest failure was um, you have to keep up with the times. I think our biggest financial failure uh, was a film that never got out of the gate when everybody was going to high def in video, listening to certain decision makers that were adamant about shooting on film. Uh, it raised the price of the film $400,000 more than it should have been, which put us more in the hole. And it was, a, it, that's what I learned is that you were never going to crawl our way out. And that was kind of a thing in Boogie Nights, if you remember, um, mm -hmm. with yeah, 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 yeah. videotape, man, videotape. And I've known a lot of distributors over the years that were always behind the ball when it went from going from film to video, video mm -hmm. to DVD, DVD to Blu-ray. And that was the one thing I learned is this really good film never saw the light of day because it was just buried in financial woe because they just, they made, and I was part of the above the line decisions on that. And I should have fought harder. <laughs> Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, if you want loyalty, get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. When you're when you're when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you know, your phone doesn't ring, and and uh, the people that you would consider, you know, your brothers in arms or your your you know the the people in the foxhole. It's it's loyalty in this industry. I don't think it's very 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 rare. And, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's just it is, is, you know, I, I get attached to people a little more than I should emotionally because I, I believe I find somebody of like mind. And, and then again, I go back to, you want loyalty, get a dog. You sir are a nice guy who has been beaten up by the business and have shrapnel along the way. We I'm assuming, I'm assuming 30 years ago, you were much nicer and less cynical than you are now. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was definitely less <laughs> cynical. Sure. I, I a lot the stars, cynical. the stars were still in the eye. The sparkle was still in the eye. I still had the, I was still youthful exuberance and excitement and <laughs> like the late, great Dickie Fox. I clap my hands and I say, it's going to be a great day. Great day. Uh, wow. exactly. Fuck, here we go again. <laughs> um, and uh, three of your favorite films of all time. The, well, the films that impacted my life the most um, sideways. I love that film, but, mm -hmm. but growing up, uh, and, and Jerry Maguire, but growing up, it was the black stallion. It was chariots yes. of fire and it yes. was on golden pond. Those were films that my wow. father showed me when I was about eight or nine years old that made me fall in love with the idea of filmmaking. And there you go. And and where... they, still play. they still play today. And where can people find a uh, double threat and find out more about you and what you're doing, sir? Oh, bless you. Well, um, Double Thread is available on Amazon Prime. Uh, but there's just like 15 or 20 different platforms. And I'm sorry to say, I don't know them off the top of my tongue. They're easy to find. It's on Xbox. It's on, you know, Google Play. Just, double, just hit Double Thread and Google. And double Thread it. starring Danielle C. Ryan, Donald Lavieri, Matthew Lawrence, directed by yours truly. Um, you'll find it. Um, yeah, you could go to uh, whatyoudontlearninfilmschool.com. That's the website for my book, which has a lot of information. If you if you care and you want to go to my website, it's shanestanley.net. It'll take you wherever you need to go. Um, and that's it. I'm, I'm, uh, that's how you find me. And that's what I'm up to. <laughs> and if you guys want to check out his book on audiobook. Yes, you could, always, right you could always head over to uh, IndieFilmHustle.com and and do a search there for it, and or go to Audible, and it's it's on Audible. Uh, That's right. And it's and it's it's a bestseller. People love it, and it's it's good. And of course, if you want to check out Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, it's not too far either. No, uh, you can I check those. It's a good book. double book. If you get both those books, you're going to be in good shape, sir. I'm just going to be in that. great shape. You are going to be in great shape. <laughs> you get both those books. Those are going to be. That's a film school right in itself, sir. Uh, Shane, man, thanks so much for coming on the show, but it's always a joy talking to you, man. And continue Love success it. and uh, keep keep that hustle going, brother. Hey, Alex, thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for checking out. And uh, just just keep filming. Just keep filming, guys. It'll, it'll eventually, you'll find your way, you'll find your voice. Just keep doing what you do. You'll get there.